Welcome to Tech Refresh with Kim Commando and friends from Commando.com with a K. That's K-O-M-A-N-D-O. Before we get started, real quick, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you always get these delivered or, every single week. Mike, the follow button on Apple. The follow button on anywhere that you follow anybody. You want to follow Kim <laughs> Commando. Uh, there's an old scam going around social media with a new name, and we've got that. Plus, the best ways to listen to audio books. And uh, let's see. We start with the news as we do every week. And here's Kim. I was going to start with Trump suing all of big tech, but (laughs) I decided let's not go there. Right. Instead, let's talk about something really important. For so many years, people have asked me, Kim, if I put my cell phone up to my head, will I get cancer? And I've always said the same thing. I had a friend of mine who was a brain surgeon over at Barrow's which is, you know, neurological center here in Phoenix. And he truly is a brain surgeon. Many, many years ago, he told me that I should never put my phone in my bra, in my pocket, or hold it up to my head. And I said, why? And he says, well, we're starting to see increases of brain tumors on the right-hand side. And so that was the advice that I passed along, saying that this was a friend of mine who was a brain surgeon, and this is what he does. Well, news out this past week that UC Berkeley, they have some new research that that actually says there's a strong link between cell phone radiation and tumors, particularly in the brain. They took a look at the statistical findings from 46 different studies around the world, and then they found that the use of a cell phone for more than 1,000 hours, if you break that down, 17 minutes a day over a 10-year period, increased the risk of tumors. Get this. Wow. By 60%. Oh. Yeah, that says a lot. Yeah, that's huge. They pointed to findings that they say that the cell phone has been used 10 or more years. It actually doubled the risk of brain tumors. Now, 97% of all Americans own a cell phone of some kind. So what does the FDA say? Okay, They say, to date, there is no consistent or credible scientific evidence of health problems caused by the exposure to radio frequency energy admitted by cell phones. A direct opposite exactly. of what the study says. Yeah. They also say that the FCC has set a limit on radio frequency energy that remains, this is the quote, remains acceptable for protecting the public health. Okay. So, what can you do to reduce your exposure? Because obviously there is a strong correlation. So, don't put the phone near your head. That's number 1. You don't want to carry your phone on your body. Put it in your purse, briefcase, backpack. And I know I'm guilty of it, too. We all put it in our back pockets, right? I mean, that's what we do. When you said bra, I thought, oh, no, I do that sometimes in a sports bra. Mm. You know, I was going down Piesto a Peak probably about six months ago, and a young woman was coming up, and she had her phone in her bra. And I looked at her, I said, you don't know me, and I don't know you, but that's the last place I would put that. Mm. And she was in her early 20s. She's like, oh, no, it's fine. I'm like, okay, just wanted to let you know. <laughs> uh, use speaker, put it on airplane mode. Now, this is also interesting. When there's only one or two bars that are displayed showing the strength and connectivity, cell phones will actually put out more RF energy to connect to the cell phone towers. So that's even worse when you have one or two signals. Because a lot of people say, oh, well, I only have one or two bars. That's not going to be a big deal. Also true when you're using your phone in a fast-moving car, bus, or train. Why? Because the phone is emitting more RF energy to maintain this connection as it moves from cell tower to cell tower. So bottom line here, keep your cell phone 10 inches away from your body. That's the rule. And what about uh, for, like, Bluetooth? They say no Bluetooth and also maybe even a wired Uh, Bluetooth is fine. You're not going to get the RF energy there. But I don't know. I'm still going to err on the side of caution right now because all this technology is so new. I really only use my phone in speaker mode. How about you, Al? I don't think about it much, honestly. Um, I use my phone regular. I, I do it through my Bluetooth headphones sometimes, which I prefer just for convenience sake. But then my phone is usually in my back pocket. So I've got some uh, habits to change. So let's keep on the subject of death Mm -hmm. because it's always a happy (laughs) thing. Okay. Um, There's an online calculator that you can answer a few questions and it will tell you whether or not you're going to die within the next five years. Oh, good. Okay. So would you use it, Al? Sure. I'm going to go up to my desk and use it when we're done. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I did too. Uh I did. (laughs) Um, The good doctors of Canada, they say that you need to be prepared for death. So it's the respect 
calculator. It predicts your death within five years based on your decline in activities. Uh, maybe you have some heart conditions or you're diagnosed with some other disease. Well, here's the deal. What they did is they really put this calculator out. So what they say is that if an adult child can plan when to take a leave of absence to be with their parent or decide when to take the last family vacation together, that you can go to this calculator and figure that out. Isn't the Internet fabulous? How handy. <laughs> it is so good. Uh, we're going to have a link to the calculator, I'm sure, over the weekend at commando.com, Al. We sure will. You know, did you hear the calculus teacher took the student's calculator away? Did you know that? Why? No, why? He was viewing graphic material. <laughs> yes. but, um, but, but I was thinking about this seriously, calculators. I think if my calculator had a history, it would be more embarrassing than my browsing history. Oh, uh, I completely agree. Those are my most, when you think about someone looking at your search history, those are my most embarrassing. How do you spell? Some word you should know how to spell. <laughs> right. Adding up two numbers that yes. I should be able to do in my head. I know. It's so crazy because you sit there like you're doing percentages and you're like, okay, I used to be able to do that in my head, <laughs> but now it doesn't even. Okay, one more story. Uh, Instagram, there's a new law that will jail influencers for secretly editing their lips, their boobs, their muscles to look better. That's right. Uh, if the Instagram influencers don't clearly state that they've edited their photos, which are ads, they could be fined or imprisoned. They have to clearly label any Instagram post that has been retouched. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Can you imagine someone going to jail for that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not here in the United States. Um, what country do you think? Somewhere in Europe, I would guess. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Russia? Norway. Oh. The Norwegian monarch, King Harold V. He's going to have to decide when the law comes into effect. I mean, Instagram influencers, I don't know. I mean, I remember back when they were just simply called hookers. I mean, <laughs> I, mean gosh. I was thinking they should just sponsor it by the like, like the photo editing software. Hey, there you go. You Sponsored know, make by a Adobe. Few bucks on it. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, what is the weight of an Instagrammer's brain? Anyone? What? One Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Ben is on vacay. I can't believe we let him go on vacation. He needed it. We all do. I right. think he's camping. But here's the deal. When he's back next week, we have to ask him everything that he bought camping. With. Oh, yeah. I mean, all the digital stuff. Because, oh, you know, did you see that solar thing he had? <laughs> I mean, it could like, it could, he brought solar panels that can, I think, power up a small city. Yeah, he definitely could. The first time I knew Ben was really a gadget person we were shopping for something for an Amazon article on our website, and he found a camping stove, like an actual stove. You can bake cookies in it. You can do whatever you want. And he thought this was a great purchase. He's been trying to convince his <laughs> wife ever since to get it. I, I don't think she's on board, which is not surprising. All right. So, Al, now it's your turn to do the news. It sure is. We put out a survey not too long ago about big tech and about how much our readers trust it. One of the stats that really stood out to me, 83% of people said, I think smart speakers are listening all the time, not just when you say the wake words. Well, you might be onto something. Uh, Google reps were talking to India's Parliamentary Standing Committee on Information Technology, all about what they collect, what they do. And the team admitted that sometimes audio is recorded by the Google Assistant, even when the user hasn't triggered the AI by saying, <laughs> OK, Google. Oopsies. Now, oops. <laughs> they didn't necessarily say because it's accidentally triggered or because we just start the recording. That's a little unclear. But what we do know is, yes, human employees might be listening to those conversations, too. Back in 2019, both Amazon and Google were in a lot of trouble with people once it came out that, yeah, human contractors listen to these recordings. Yeah. I mean, you just have to know that it's just sitting there. It is just listening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't really like the idea of someone listening to everything I say to Alexa, especially a person, right? Um, or what she accidentally picks up. So Google says only about 0.2% of the recordings are reviewed by people. Well, okay, that's not much, but if you're one of those 0.2%. Yeah, but, you know, I wonder what the 0.2% really is, because it sounds small. Okay, but they have hundreds of millions of, of algorithms. Yes. They probably look over all of them and then find the 0.2% that are interesting. Well, and I thought this was interesting. They said, we don't listen to anything sensitive. Well, how do you determine what's sensitive? How do you know? You know, exactly. It always reminds me of that, you know, the Amazon PR people. They will mm. always, always write me right after I say, 
that the Alexa echoes that they are always listening, and they just want me to clarify and say, no, they're only listening for the wake word. That's it. They're just listening. I'm like, well, aren't they listening all the time then? (laughs) And then you never get a response to that, do you? Nope. That's when they stop emailing. Well, if you've got a Google Home Google Assistant on your phone. You can go to myactivity.google.com to hear all of your recordings. You can delete. You can set up to auto-delete. The trick with this one, though, is you can turn off voice recordings and audio activity, but if you do, your voice assistant won't work. So you're (laughs) stuck with it. Um, And if you have an Alexa, you can go in and change the settings there so that they are not allowed to listen to your voice recordings for testing purposes. So go into the Alexa app and do that if you care about someone listening. Well... Or you can just do what I did. Put it in the garage. She's in the Unplug garage. Her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think this is the worst thing. When you love an app or a program, it's perfect. You've used it for years. And then another company buys it, changes something about it, and you hate it. Or it just doesn't work as well. Uh, I think I think of Picasa. That was really one that they just oh, got I rid of. I loved Picasa. That know. was such a great photo management program. Yeah. Well, have you guys heard the news about Audacity? No. It's been everywhere. That's the program that we use. Yeah. To edit to edit audio. And it's free and it's great. Right. Yeah, it's awesome. If you're into podcasting, audio, music, maybe you've tried it. It's free. It's open source. It works with Macs, Linux, Windows, everything. Um, It's easy. I learned how to use it in like five minutes watching YouTube video, which was nice. Um, That's why I was really bummed to see this news. A news source is calling Audacity spyware now. So a new company bought it uh, back in May. And in early July, they updated the privacy policy. They added all this stuff saying that the app is going to now collect. Wait a second. Let me wait before you get it. So I thought it was open source. It is. But a company bought it? Yeah, they still own it. You can take the code and change it. But yeah, a company owns it. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was like, wait, whoa, when did that happen? Yeah. Well, with this update, they said that The app may collect data necessary for law enforcement, litigation, and authorities' requests, meaning we can send your audio if someone asks for it. Now, Ars Technica had a really great article, and they made a good point in it. Whether our privacy policy says it or not, if the police came asking for information on one of their users, there's a good chance that the company would turn it over anyway. And if not, the company might not last for long. Now, we know Apple has been famous for fighting this, but most companies, they're probably just going to do that anyway. But if this is editing software on your computer, how do they get copies of the audio recordings? That is a good question. I'm not sure. They must dial into your computer so they know what you're recording. Well, the things they do collect... Their limited data collection is going to be things like your operating system version, your processor, your IP address, and then any error reports if you opted into those. So they say they're doing it because the new edition of the software is going to automatically check for updates and allow you to report errors. It doesn't do that right now. Right now you download it, you really don't have to give any information or really do anything, and it doesn't send much back. But it looks like they're planning to add some capabilities, so they want more information from you. Now, lots of news outlets went around saying, this is spyware. They're going to send everything back. There was also a clause in there that they may share data with their main office in Russia, which people of course they do. really didn't like. <laughs> Muse Group, the new owner, they backtracked on a lot of this and said, you know what? This was bad wording. We're going to go back and fix it. We're never going to sell your information. We're not going to give anything out. So we'll see how it lands. But... I think we're still safe to use Audacity. You know, it just seems like everything's going back to Russia. I mean, you know, if Russia were to attack Turkey from the rear, I mean, would Greece help? <laughs> oh, no. I'm sorry. That was a bad one. <laughs> that was a good one. All right. We've been going for the last couple of days without printers here at the office. Exactly. Yeah. Before we came down from the podcast, I was getting ready to print out my notes. And John said, wait, you can't print yet. I need to turn the spools back on. That's because there's a Windows flaw. It's called Print Nightmare. Uh, Bad news, as you can tell by the name. So people haven't been able to print for a while. That was really the fix for it. Turn off your printer spools. Well, there's a patch for it. If you've got a Windows 10 computer, go update any Windows computer. Uh, The flaw has been fixed, so get on it. Because it allowed hackers to get in and mess with network settings. All by this this rogue print spooling function. Who knew? Who knew? So do you you need to manually then update your, your Windows system? Yep. Yeah. 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 I mean, what did the printer say when it ran out of paper? Anyone? Hmm. Anyone? Oh, sheet. 
<laughs> You're on a roll today. Uh, you know. Where do you find all of these? <laughs> I don't know. It's just, you know, it's just they, just, they come to her. It's just I know. Crazy. They remember. It's if you ever us. see that little light bulb above her head, because the pun just came to her. <laughs> That's usually the four o'clock in the morning light bulb. Oh my gosh, that is. <laughs> in a few minutes, using email aliases. Also, there's a milestone just happened in flying cars we're going to mention Ooh-hoo. in a bit. And brand new or not true with Kim Commando herself uh, is next on Tech Refresh with Kim Commando and Friends from Commando.com. Welcome back to Tech Refresh with Kim Commando and Friends from Commander.com. Brand new or not true is just ahead. First of all, uh, what about using email aliases? Yeah, if you've never used email aliases, you're missing out. There's two really great functions for these, organization and privacy. First, what's an alias? Well, it's a version of your email address. I'll go through the Google steps because lots of people use Gmail. It's really handy to do. Like, So if you want to sign up for something, and you don't want to give them like your primary email address because you're like, I know you're going to spam me. I know it. I know it. I know <laughs> it. you're going to do it. Or maybe you just want to put an email address on a website, yeah. maybe uh, on a product listing, whatever it is. So that this way you really keep that private email address, just something that you hand out and then only to like select businesses, family and friends. I have, oh gosh. I have so many different email. I probably have five or six email addresses. Do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the easiest ways is you put in your username and then a plus sign and then whatever you want after that. It's so easy. You don't need to go into your settings. You just do it when you're signing up. Now, that's for Gmail. It is, yes. So it would be like, you know, like the Amazing Alley Content Queen plus... Newsletters. Newsletters at gmail.com or whatever it is. Right. So newsletters is a good example for that. Or bills. Say you want to organize things so that everything that is your bills email address alias goes into one folder. Well, you can do that. You set them all with the same email address. So content queen alley plus bills at gmail.com. Great. All my bills emails go there. They go into one folder. And you don't have to configure this. No, no. I mean, because normally when you get a new email address, you're like, Oh, God, is it an IMAP? And I got to go through all the steps and what's the <laughs> server and blah, blah, blah. But no, this is just this just works. It's it does. Crazy. I'm so glad you're telling people. That. Yeah. And then on the privacy side, like Kim said, this is a really good way. If you have a feeling I want to get whatever some company is offering, I don't know what they're going to do with my email address. Yeah, like that white paper. You're like, oh, yeah, I know that this is like SEO secrets. <laughs> and, right. you know, I'm going to learn something. I fell for that yesterday. Oh, uh, yeah. Did so, you learn anything? No, I didn't. <laughs> I was so disappointed. But if you had put in Kim Commando plus SEO secrets at gmail.com, great. Then you know if you get any emails to that email address because they gave away your email. And then you could just wipe it out. Just remove it. There you go. I love it. It's a great tip. I started doing that. I think, uh, Kim, you talked about this a while back, and I started doing it uh, for real estate stuff. And, yeah, everything goes in. It's a junk mail folder. I just don't even look at it. Or, you know, you can, like I say, categorize for So, like, is your email address, things. like, you know, Mike, the real estate mogul? <laughs> <laughs> it's not even my real name, actually. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it's like Scott Forrest because... Uh, Scott yeah. Forrest. <laughs> it sounds like a porno guy. <laughs> it does. Scott Forrest. <laughs> no, it's actually I got it's a big a, tree. It's, it's Scott Forrest Investments. <laughs> so should have said that. It at sounds the beginning. legit. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Sorry, I went there. Uh, I shouldn't have done no, that. No, it's exactly. It's just one of those shows. <laughs> it is. That's okay. It's time now for America's newest national game show sensation, where you can play and guess is it brand new or not true. Every week, literally thousands of new product sites, apps, and services are announced in the technology world. Some destined for greatness, others not so much. Well, when playing Brand New or Not True, we're going to present you, the home listener, with three products, sites, or ideas. Now, we want you to guess and play along. Uh, Two of these products are going to be fake. One is real. Kim and I are going to guess. Allie's got the products. What's the theme? Boy, oh boy, it's drones. Okay, good one. Drones. Okay, product one. There are a lot of drone apps. And a lot of them cover pretty boring stuff. Airspace rules, conditions that tell you when you can fly, traffic alerts, rules. Did I mention rules? There's a lot of rules. But if you are an artistic drone owner, 
There's Drone Eye. It's an app that shows you where to find the most beautiful shots in your area. Drone Eye's gallery is all user curated and includes the best places to shoot video and take stills in about 150 cities across the world. You can add to that count by uploading your own recordings along with the coordinates to help other pilots navigate to that beautiful spot. Drone Eye is ad supported and it's free to use. Awesome. All right. Do you want to know something funny when you were mentioning that? So, Ian is hanging out in Beverly Hills with his friend Max. Okay. Max Pastor. Max is a very talented filmmaker. Uh huh. And he's 20 years old. When Max started getting into film, they came over to the house and Max was dressed. They, I think they were 10 years old. They had some video project they had to do. And Max came over dressed like Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> you know, with a little bow tie, yeah. <laughs> and he had all the the paraphernalia. I mean, and, I mean, this was real. And I looked and I said, Max, you're like really dressed. And, you know, all the other kids are like wearing like you know Under Armour t-shirts and you know yeah. shorts. And he's like, No, when you're filming, you have to be a professional. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. All right. So Max and Ian are having a great time in L.A. And Max brings his drone because now he's going to NYU Film School. I have to show you this movie that this kid did about New York. It's fab. You'll love this, Alex, because yeah. you lived in the city. Yeah. So they bring the drone into Beverly Hills. And so Max puts his drone up and he's got his license. And because he wants to get some shots of LA and everything. And then Ian was telling me that they went over Walt Disney's house that is now owned by a Chinese billionaire. Mm. Okay. Mm. And up on the screen, Max it says, no fly zone, no fly zone. Oh. Okay, so he's not allowed to do that. So they said, you know what? We'll go to Jeff Bezos' house. Okay, so they take the drone up. You told me they take the drone up, and he's got these, like, 12-foot hedges all around the property. And they take it up, and Max is, like, waiting for it to come up to say no-fly zone. I mean, this is the world's richest man, worth yeah. $221 billion or some number like that I saw today. And he goes up, and he's flying into the backyard. He keeps going. He keeps going. And then all of a sudden, he sees on the ground is like a security guard <gasps> yelling, saying, get that out of here, get that out of oh, here. No. <laughs> <laughs> so Max is like, oh, crap. And so he you know, takes the drone out. But you would think like Jeff Bezos would have a no-fly zone. You would think. Yeah, somebody overlooked something somewhere. All right, so Drone Eye, that's what made me think of that story. Drone Eye, that's number one. Okay, what's Product number two? number two. If you are sick of taking beautiful photos, videos, flying your drone, why not train your drone to do some tricks? Well, really, you're training yourself. The Drone Racing Obstacle Course from Eagle Pro gives you a whole new use for your drone. The kit includes three plastic hoops. They're about 25 inches wide. Each one sits on two little plastic feet, so you can set up a course anywhere you like. You can use them inside or outside. The materials are all crash safe, so if you crash your drone into it, you're going to be okay. Uh, the setup just takes a few minutes. All the pieces snap into place. It's compatible with any drone, 15 inches wide or smaller, and the three-pack will cost you $29.99. Okay. Okay. Right. Product three, the worst part about owning a drone is crashing, right? You can throw away a lot of money with just one accident. The propellers are one of the most fragile parts, so why not upgrade to a set that won't break? Most propellers are made from carbon fiber, you know, reinforced composite, something like that. If you have a lightweight model, though, you can give the, give the flyability rubber propellers a try. Crash all you want, and they won't break. Each blade has undergone a precise dynamic balance test, there's less flight noise, lower power consumption, so that means your drone can fly longer. And if you do crash, hey, at least you know your propellers won't break. I said lightweight, and that's because right now these rotors only work with models like the DJI Mini and smaller. One set will cost $19.99. Mm, these are, this is a tough one. They always are. Because you know, I think I could see all three being true. Right? Ooh. And if it's not... You know, these, we always talk about these opportunities that we've lost out on over the years. <laughs> yes, yes. This, one. this might be something. All right, so what do you think, Mike? Well, uh, let's see. Well, the three products, the Drone Eye, the Drone Racing Obstacle Course, and then the propellers that won't break made out of plastic. Great products, as always. Uh, I'll start with the uh, Drone Eye, best places to take pictures for free. You know, that sounds like a really viable product, but for some reason I'm going to say that's the that's not true. Um, the Drone Racing Obstacle Course, uh, I thought not true right off the bat, just because you if you crash your drone, it ain't going to be good, even <laughs> if you crash it soft, right? So I, I don't think an obstacle course would, would work very well unless... 
I don't know, there's a lot of technical things that you could keep away from the hoops or whatever. The propellers that won't break uh, for $19.99 for small drones made out of plastic and balanced and everything, I think that's a pretty cool product. I think a lot of people would like that because the propellers are what you're mostly replacing when you do crash. So I'm going to say that's the real product. Okay, I don't agree with you. Okay. I like the drone eye app because I could see that because if it's not exist, if it doesn't exist, it should. Okay. Because there are those apps that you can fire up to say to give you the best Instagram shots. So why wouldn't there be that? Why wouldn't there? Um, the obstacle course is interesting to me because of drone racing. And a lot of people are getting into drone racing. Uh, the propellers, I think that would be too hard to get I, I think as far as the propellers go they have already the propeller guards mm -hmm. and they work fine because I know this because Barry crashes them all the time <laughs> um, so I think I'm going to go with the drone eye app the yes, drone eye app that's a good one yeah okay alright first up Okay, which one did neither of you pick drone racing obstacle course nobody thought the obstacle course was real well, that's the real product. Oh, <laughs> crap. <laughs> I almost went with that one. Oh, I almost man. went with that one. I, sh I should have trusted my gut. My I favorite trust review my gut. of that was, I do not recommend this product. These constantly break. Great idea, but bad execution. <laughs> They're just these little plastic hoops, and uh, apparently they don't work so good. All right, so we should come up with the Drone Eye app. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, that would be a great free app or, you know, even for like a dollar a month or something like that. You know, another app that doesn't exist that should exist is that when you're driving around Beverly Hills, Los Angeles, is and Ian and I have done this, <laughs> is that there's a woman on the side of the road off of Sunset near UCLA, and she sells star maps. Yeah. Okay. And she, I talked to her. She's a little cray-cray. And... She says that her father did the first map, and she is the legacy, and she was – Michael Jackson would come over and tell her hello, and, <laughs> you know, the map was, like, $12, but then she charged a tax, and if you wanted the other map – anyway, by the time you get done, you're, like, 20 bucks for this stupid map, okay? <laughs> but beforehand, I went online. I'm like, you know, app, Ian, there's got to be a GPS yeah. app to show you, like, where all the stars live. There isn't. I am shocked that that doesn't yeah. exist. There is no app. There was no app. Okay, so the rest of this week, we can crank out two apps, right? <laughs> yeah? Yeah, sure. It's, um, we got a couple of days. Well, we have that <laughs> show we have to do on Friday. Oh, dang it. So it might be just a little bit longer okay. than that. Okay. Kim, thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. What do you mean you'll see me next week? <laughs> yeah. Are you trying to get rid of me? Yeah, no, you'll you've see me got later on today. A thousand things to do. Well, for the podcast is what I'm saying. Well, and for everybody else, I mean, don't wait a whole week. Make <laughs> sure that you listen to the Kim Commando show. And the Commando community. Be a Commando community member so you can get all of behind the scenes And stuff. go behind the scenes because I'm telling you, if you're missing out on Mike's fun facts... <laughs> It's during the really show, right, yeah. Allie? Yeah, and, and also They're Allie's so joining us behind the scenes, yeah. and Ben is there doing another product review of some sort. So you're really truly missing out. Stop ghosting us, right? Here's what you do: you go over to getkim.com, sign up now while you're thinking about it, you get 30 days free, right? I mean, and after that, it's just a couple bucks a month. We and, are worth it. And we've got e-readers we're going to talk about, audiobooks, what's free, what's not free. Also an old scam going around with social media and a new name. It's Tech Refresh with Kim Commando and friends from commando.com. Welcome back to Tech Refresh with Kim Commando and friends from Commander.com. Every week we give you the inside scoop on what's going on in tech. So you're the source of tech information for your friends and family. This week we're going to take a look at audiobooks. What do we use? What's free? Allie's got the facts. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts, man. In the last show we were talking all about physical media. If we buy DVDs or CDs or Blu-rays or any of that stuff, and I kind of just talked about books because that's the only thing I still buy in physical form. And Mike, we started talking about audiobooks. I thought it was a good week since Ben's not here. He's not much of a reader, but we are. So I think we should get into it. Now, I brought up audiobooks and I promised I would tell you some actually affordable ways to get them. Audible, that's the big name, it's not cheap. You can try it free for 30 days, though make sure you cancel if you don't want to keep it. After that, 
for one book, it's $14.95 a month. If you want two books, it's $29.95. That's pretty expensive, right, for two books. And the credits expire after a year if you haven't used them, and they expire when you cancel. So it's kind of a use it or lose it situation. Well, wait a minute. Now, if you don't buy something one month, but you want to buy four books the next month, is that? Yeah, you can save up your credits, but no credit will carry longer than a year. So you have to watch that. Scribed is a little cheaper. Uh, that one is $9.99, and you get unlimited books. So that's better. Um, when you buy a Kindle book on Amazon, you can sometimes add on audible narration. Usually that's pretty cheap, like $3.99, but you have to buy the, the ebook first. So you buy a Kindle book and then sometimes you can add on this option. It's called audible narration. And usually they're promoted at like a discount price and it's about $3.99. You can basically read along with the book. Um, but what about free? That's really what we care about, right? There are a few options. LibriVox is a library of free audiobooks. These are read by volunteers. There's something called Open Culture and there's Lit to Go. Those are all very similar where they're really taking old books that aren't copyright protected anymore. Someone reads them, great, you can download the audiobook. My favorite option though, and I'm really surprised I forgot to mention this last time because I use it constantly. It's called Overdrive and you only need one thing to make it work a library card. So this connects to your local library, and then you can download any audiobook or ebook that your library has. And most libraries, you know, we're here in Phoenix, so we have a huge public library system. So basically any book you can think of is probably there with either an audiobook or an ebook that you can get for free. Wow. Yeah. Do you have a uh, library card, Mike? I don't. You should go get one. And I drive by the library. It's, it's, it's probably about six blocks from my house. Oh my gosh. All right, go get a library card, sign up for Overdrive. It's free. It's super easy to use. You can send audiobooks right to your phone. It's the best. I just remember going to the library and always being disappointed that the book, what I was looking for, wasn't <laughs> there. But maybe it's changed. Well, and that's the trick. You can reserve things. So on the popular audiobooks, there's going to be a wait. And usually it's a few weeks. But you'll get an email that says, hey, your book's available. So you know about it. And then you can download it right to your phone. That's great. Yeah. Very good tip. Thank you. You're welcome. It's the Tech Refresh Podcast with Kim Commando and friends. One of the things we promise every week, it's to give you tips to keep from getting scammed. So every week we talk about a new scam that you need to watch out for. And this week it's an old scam that's going around social media with a new name. Go ahead. Mike, have you ever heard of the secret sister? No. Okay. Sometimes it's called money board, gifting circle. Susu, I've never seen that one. There's a new name for this. It's called Blessing Loom. What do these all have in common? It's a pyramid scheme. The Better Business Bureau has received 68 scam reports on Blessing Loom scams in the past year, and people are losing at least $100, up to $700 a pop. Here's how it works. You get a direct message on social media. Usually it's Instagram or Facebook, but people are seeing these in messaging apps too. And it comes from a friend, a family member, maybe a stranger, and they invite you to join their blessing loom, or they use one of those other names. The message says, hey, here's a really good chance to earn some money while blessing others. You invest $100, you do it through PayPal or Venmo or some other payment app, and then spread the wealth and you'll see a return. All you need to do is recruit a few other people to invest. They recruit more people, the circle widens, everyone gets a lot of money. We like a pyramid scheme. This is a pyramid scheme, yes. It really relies on keeping new people coming in and then whoever's at the bottom, yeah, they don't get anything. So if you see the words blessing loom, stay far, far away. Be skeptical before you accept any offer like this, any money, do your research. These things have gone viral and gone around forever and ever because they work. Make sure you monitor your friend request. Don't accept a request from somebody you don't know. And be careful if you see a second friend request from someone and you say, uh, I think we're already friends. It's very likely a fake profile trying to fool you into thinking that it's that person. So no blessing loom for us. Eh, watch out for, yeah, watch out for that. That You said that's email, text, anywhere? Mostly social media. Okay. Oh, social us. media. Yes. So, Mike, if you have $100 to lend me, I can give you a good return. Well, on. you have to ask me in WhatsApp because I know that now. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So uh, maiden voyage of a new flying car. Well, it was a major milestone. We'll talk about that next. It's Tech Refresh with Kim Commando and friends on commando.com.
Hey, thanks for listening to the Tech Refresh podcast heard exclusively on the Commando Explains podcast from commando.com. If you haven't already, make sure you click the subscribe button so you get these podcasts delivered automatically every Friday with the Kim Commando Explains podcast. That also gets you the special feature podcast, which is released on Tuesday. This week, it was Dana's Daughter Has a Stalker. Wow, what a great podcast. Dana called the show uh, back in May, actually, and Kim helped her out by finding... Well, through her detective, a guy that does forensics, uh, and he just did this great job about finding out who Dana's daughter's stalker was. And it's the whole nine. This guy has an amazing history. His name is Rico. He was in the service, and he now has a law degree and a couple of other degrees. Super smart, super cool. Um, Anyway, that's on the Kim Commando Explains podcast. Get that by going to your podcast player and just searching for K-O-M-A-N-D-O. All right. We've got – there was a milestone voyage of a new flying car this week. Flying cars. It's happening. Isn't this very exciting? Okay. The air car just took its maiden voyage. A Slovakian pilot drove it. It looks like an exotic sports car. He drove it up a runway in Nitra, which is in Slovakia. Then he took off on a 35-minute flight. He landed, folded up the wings, and then drove off down the highway. This is pretty darn cool. So the air car, this is the prototype one, was developed by a company called Klein Vision, founded by a guy named Stefan Klein. He has spent 20 years trying to make a flying car. They made this for only 2 million euro, which, you know, all things considered is pretty good. This is the world's first flying car to travel between two airports. During the flight, it reached a cruising speed of 105 miles an hour and an altitude of 8,200 feet. Um, Based on the fuel it had, it could maintain that for 600 miles, which which is pretty darn far. So once the flying portion of the journey was over, you just push a button and then kind of like transformers in under three minutes the vehicle is then a perfectly road legal sports car with a 160 horsepower engine a seat for another passenger and it's even a convertible of course it is okay don't get too excited there are a lot of hurdles before we can all jump into our own flying car sadly There's a company called Terra Fuiga. They just received an airworthiness certificate from the FAA. The bad news is, though, the car can't be driven legally. It hasn't been proven to be roadworthy in crash tests. So the plane part's okay, the car part's not. Bummer. So Klein Vision, I'm holding out hope for the air car because right now it seems like our best bet. I think uh, probably if I was building a car company, a flying car company, I'd probably go to Europe or Mexico or somewhere mm-hmm. other than the United States because it's not going to happen here anytime soon Absolutely. with all the regulations, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's exciting. You know, if you listen or watch the show for the, with the Commando community, I've been talking about flying cars practically every weekend. <laughs> I don't know, like the last three or six months, flying cars are like everywhere. There's all kinds of different... Uh, companies, a couple of companies in California that are in, that have the flying cars. So, would you ride in a flying car, Mike? I would try it. Sure. Yeah. yeah you know, if it was, uh, if it, you know, if it was, if it's been tested and everything. Yeah. Actually, actually, the the what I was talking about on the show is the new flying cars. Are you really don't have to be a pilot anymore because they're just flying computers, and you know, you have a stick probably. And they kind of keep the airspeed, and if it and, and they have a parachute in them, the ones that are yeah. uh, production ones. Yeah. So it, they're a lot safer than that you would think. My mind instantly goes to, well, Tesla can't quite get, you know, the driving part <laughs> right. Self-driving car, right. So do I trust self-flying? Not yet, but I want to because that would be awesome. Well, they're they're computers, and especially ones with the multi-engines. You mm-hmm. know, they have the propellers that kind of look like a helicopter and then they transition into a plane. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, it's very, very cool. It All right. Cool. Thanks for listening to the Tech Refresh podcast. And if you'd like to comment about the podcast, good or bad, mostly good, send us an email to podcasts at commando.com. Again, that's podcasts at commando.com. On behalf of Kim, Allie, I'm Mike, and we'll see you next time. And for the latest articles anytime, go to commando.com with a K. That's K-O-M-A-N-D-O. 